Namaste. So let's begin by taking a look at the first chapter of Lankavatara Sutra, where the Buddha summarizes the contents and the whole mood, really the whole message of the Sutra. All that is seen in the world is devoid of effort and action, because all things in the world are like a dream, or like an image miraculously projected. This is not comprehended by the philosophers and the ignorant, but those who see things thus see them truthfully. Those who see things otherwise walk in false discrimination, and, as they depend upon false discrimination, they cling to dualism. The world seen by false discrimination is like seeing one's own image reflected in a mirror, or one's shadow, or the moon reflected in water, or an echo heard in a valley. People grasping their own shadows of false discrimination become attached to this thing and that thing, and failing to abandon dualism, they go on forever falsely discriminating, and thus never attain tranquility. By tranquility is meant oneness, and oneness gives birth to the highest samadhi, which is gained by entering into the realm of noble wisdom, realizable only within one's inmost consciousness. So this is the message of Lankavatara Sutra in a nutshell. The world that we see is imagination. He uses so many examples to show that what we see is not what's really there at all. And Ramana Maharshi uses one of these same examples, which is like a miraculous projection. You know, 2,000 years ago, there was no movie theaters. But in Ramana's time, there were. And so he could compare it to a cinema and say that the projector is like the mind. The screen is like the senses or the consciousness. And then you're sitting there, the self, in this darkened room, which means covered by ignorance, and seeing all these pictures and identifying with them, thinking that they're real, and getting all involved with them, having feelings about them, you know, trying to predict what's going to happen. It's entangling. But it's entanglement with an illusion. Because the objects depicted on the screen don't really exist. And the same thing is going on with us. We see this world which appears to be made up of innumerable separate objects, each of which has independent existence and a self-nature of its own. But this isn't true at all. Hence, we make what's called false discrimination. We draw boundaries where there are no boundaries. We attribute qualities to things that don't have them, like self-existence, independence, and so on. We identify with these different objects, and we think, for example, the body is myself, or the mind is I. And we go to great trouble and great effort to justify all this when it's, it's a view that's always falling apart because it's contradicted by our actual experience. So what is the world really? Oneness. The world is one seamless and fully interconnected whole, 
Brahman. We draw boundaries by discriminating one object from another, one moment in time from another, one consciousness from another, one space from another, and so on. But these boundaries are artificial. They're imaginary. They don't really exist. And the way we do this is with words. We assign words to the forms of the things that we perceive in the world. And then we build intricate networks of these worlds based on words. So in our view, in illusion, everything is connected, but it's connected by words and symbols, name and form. That's not the way it is at all. To one who is self-realized, the world is an effortless, egoless, imageless, whole, with no boundaries, no objects, no names and forms, all of which are simply imagination, because they're temporary. Try to understand. Real existence means changeless and timeless, without beginning or end. So what are the things that are always there? Well, the self, consciousness, space and time appear to be always there. Well, they're still material, but they're far more durable than the objects contained in them. See, here's the thing. <laughs> We're looking in the wrong end of the telescope. Huh? Did you ever do that? Did you ever pick up a telescope and then look in the objective lens instead of the eyepiece or binoculars? Well, what do you see? Everything looks very small and far away. But that's not really the way it is. So this world is actually within the self. And we are the self. So instead of the self <laughs> being within the world, you see, it's the complete opposite. The world is within the self. The world exists only within the mind. And when the mind changes, the apparency of the world also changes. This is everybody's experience. We go to sleep at night. Our consciousness changes from Jagrat to Swapna. The world disappears. And then we experience another world of dreams. And that world runs by completely different rules. Any kind of crazy thing can happen. <laughs> and then we go into deep sleep, Sushupti. And even that world disappears. And there's nothing, or apparently nothing. Actually, the self is still there. Consciousness is still there. But now the consciousness is Turiya, which is consciousness of consciousness. And this is why I love to meditate going in and out of sleep. Because if we take the view that the object of Turiya consciousness is the other three states of consciousness, then as they come into existence one after another, we can observe this. So, for example, in lucid dreaming, if one knows, oh, I'm dreaming, that means one is in Turiya. And 
in Jagrat consciousness, when we're aware of the world around us, or so we think, <laughs> if we are aware that we're in Jagrat consciousness, we're aware of our awareness. We're conscious of our consciousness. This is Turiya. This is Samadhi. It's not that in order to experience Samadhi, I have to go in a cave <laughs> and sit down and become blind and deaf and dumb. No, that might be helpful to experience Samadhi in the beginning. But real Samadhi, bulletproof Samadhi, as I like to call it, is the Samadhi where we can go out in the world and still maintain the view that this world is within my mind and my mind is within my consciousness and my consciousness is within the self. So in the realized state, in reality, there is no world or the world is only an appearance. It neither exists nor it doesn't exist. Like the famous example of the rope and the snake. One goes out at night and the light is very dim and sees a rope. But one identifies it as a snake. And so to the person in that moment, the snake is real. Huh? The perception of the snake is real. Then in the next moment when he sees, oh, it's actually just a rope. That's the actuality. That's the real reality. But in the moment when he was in illusion and saw it as a snake, that perception was reality for him. So in the same way, the world is actually effortless. It's a machine that goes on by itself. We have nothing to do with it. It's made by nature. But because we identify with the mind and senses, we think the world is real. We think the boundaries between objects and we think the labels and names of things are actualities. But this is like seeing the snake. The perception is real, but there's no actual object there. What we are seeing is the seamless oneness of existence. Saguna Brahman. Then we go and divide it up into this and that object and become attached to them. But wait a minute, like the pictures on the movie screen, they come and go. They change their qualities. Time moves on. And so we suffer because to lose these objects is perceived as suffering, as a kind of death. It's only the death of the ego. It's again seeing the rope as a snake. But to one who sees it like that, it appears to be reality. So we suffer. And this suffering is entirely self-created. There is no need for it. So if we can turn things around, huh? turn the telescope around and look through it the right way, then we see a very different vision of the world and the self. And this is what Lankavatara Sutra is trying to get us to do. The Buddha is trying to get us to see the reality because to see that means the end of all suffering. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung.